Now at five, a standoff in Cornelius ends peacefully. Why police initially went looking for this suspect? And the search for a missing Gresham woman in Pennsylvania. Why investigators fear the worst? And the latest on the deadly mass shooting in Illinois. Why police now say this shooter shouldn't have even had a gun. Hello everyone and welcome to KGW News at 5. I'm Nina Melhoff. People in a Cornelius neighborhood breathing a sigh of relief tonight after deputies have a standoff with a man and it ended peacefully. And that's where Art Edwards is tonight. So Art, how did this all go down? Well, Nina, it all started out when police got word that a man who was wanted for possession of methamphetamine was, a ha was at a house here on this street in South Cornelius. Now, the arrest didn't go exactly the way authorities had hoped, and this neighborhood ended up being filled with Cornelius police and other law enforcement. So this is a picture right after they were able to arrest 37-year-old Gilberto Miranda Jr. Police got word that he was in a house in the 400 block of South 18th Avenue here in Cornelius. When they got here, the homeowner wouldn't let them in and Miranda wouldn't come out. So they called in the tactical negotiation team, goes by SWAT in other jurisdictions. They surrounded the house and waited for a warrant. When they told Miranda that they had the warrant to come in and arrest him and they also had a canine unit on standby, he decided to come out, and that's when they made the arrest. So right now, Miranda is in the Washington County Jail. He does face two felony charges for possession of methamphetamine and some other charges. The homeowner in this case, 34-year-old uh, Melissa Templin, was also arrested by authorities. She now faces a felony charge for hindering prosecution because she didn't let authorities into the house immediately when they went there. Nina, back to you. Crazy afternoon for that neighborhood. All right, Art, thank you. We now know the name of the Salem man suspected of killing a woman. Police say Derek Beaton was at the home of 55-year-old Leanne Batty yesterday when they found her dead from an apparent stabbing. Investigators are now charging Beaton with her murder. He'll face a judge on Tuesday. An Oregon family is waiting by the phone in agony tonight, hoping to hear crews on the East Coast have finally found the body of Haley Lorenzen. This is video of today's search along a Pennsylvania River. Haley was from Gresham, and a few months ago she moved to the East Coast for love. Police say she met this man online, went to meet him, and they say he killed her. KGW's Maggie Vespa has tonight's update. In the nearly two months since Haley went missing, winter weather has hindered this search several times. Today, our NBC affiliate in northeastern Pennsylvania rolled as crews went full steam ahead. They're combing this river because a woman told police this is where the 24-year-old's boyfriend dumped her body. His name is Philip Walters. Police said the woman who tipped them off was also dating him. Walters has been charged with homicide. We're just, all we can do is wait until they find her. It's just frustrating, yeah. And we miss her so much. Tracy Dominguez is Haley's aunt. The family is mostly here in Oregon, feeling frozen in time. Haley went to visit Walters just a few months ago, then decided to stay. Days after Christmas, he called to say she was missing. They suspected him right away. His demeanor was not, there was no concern, there was no just no concern at all. All he said was the police are doing uh, everything they're doing to find her. No one's heard from Haley since. The community where she went missing has rallied around the family, even throwing a fundraiser at a bar earlier this week. Strangers now feeling connected to this bi-coastal mystery of the Gresham woman who thought she'd found love. Just keep praying and, and you know, praying that we find her so we can bring her home and and put her to rest. We, you know, we need her home. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. So without her body and just going on the word of another woman saying she was killed, police are not saying what kind of evidence they have to charge Walters with the homicide. Haley's family has been traveling back and forth to Pennsylvania during this whole thing, so they've set up donation drives to help them pay for the flights, including a GoFundMe to help with expenses. We have posted that link at KGW.com.
It wasn't the alarm clock that woke people up at a Eugene motel this morning. Check out this car that smashed into the corner of the America's Best Value Inn on West 6th Avenue in Eugene. Witnesses say the driver was speeding and lost control before crashing into the brick building. There was a person sleeping in that room. They're okay. The 22 year old driver was arrested for DUI. Like the idea or hate it, Portland police are gearing up to try out body cameras on some of their officers. And today they talk to citizens about how that program should work. Today in East Portland, people gathered in small groups to talk about different aspects of police body cams and give feedback. Should they be recording at all times? In what situations should they be turned off or muted? How long after a situation can the officer review the footage or write a report? If nothing of importance happened on their shift, what happens to that recorded video footage? All questions that Portland police want to make sure they run by the public before they start this pilot program because it raises a lot of ethical questions. On the one hand, there's a need that the public has for transparency in its police service. On the other hand, there are people's legitimately held privacy interests. You know, if I come into your home on a call and I have a camera running and that footage could someday be public record, you have an interest in maintaining some privacy there. And so ultimately what we're trying to do with our body worn camera policy is achieve that balance. Portland police will whittle it down to two video camera companies that will be in the test phase for traffic cops and central Portland officers. Once the pilot is over, they'll decide if they want the full bureau to wear them. The Vatican has expelled the once Archbishop of Washington, D.C. from the Roman Catholic priesthood after investigators confirmed sex abuse allegations against him. Ex-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick was at one time in charge of the Washington, D.C. and Newark, New Jersey diocese. He was removed from public ministry last year after he was accused of sexually abusing two children decades ago, as well as allegedly sleeping with adult seminarians. McCarrick is the highest ranking Catholic churchman to be defrocked, meaning he's been made a lay person, no longer able to celebrate mass or other sacraments or wear the vestments. And the fact is, the fact remains is that some uh, disgruntled person walked in and had access to a firearm that he shouldn't have had access to. Tonight, we're learning more about the gunman in a deadly mass shooting at a warehouse in Illinois. Investigators now say he was not legally allowed to have a gun. And when police found out, they told him he had to turn it over to them. We're also learning more about the victims in this workplace shooting, which left five people dead and several others injured. NBC's Chris Pallone has the latest. Many questions remain after the country's latest workplace massacre. This one happened in Aurora, Illinois. Attention, uh, all police. Uh, Aurora does have an active shooter. Five people shot to death Friday at a manufacturing plant that makes plumbing valves. Police said Saturday the shooter, Gary Martin, never should have had a gun to begin with. But absolutely, he was not supposed to be in possession of a firearm. Investigators say Martin started shooting in a meeting in which he was being fired after 15 years on the job. Five years ago, state police ordered him to turn in his gun when they discovered Martin was a convicted felon, the same 40 caliber Smith & Wesson he used Friday. After a FOID card revocation, the subject is provided a letter stating that they need to, um, they need to relinquish their firearms, and we're looking into why that did not happen. Outside the Henry Pratt Company plant, friends and co-workers are remembering the dead. Police identified them as human resources manager Clayton Parks, intern Trevor Wayner, mold operator Russell Beyer, plant manager Josh Pinkert, and stockroom attendant Vicente Juarez. Your words can't even describe how good of a dad he was. <laughs> oh, he was a great dad. Five police officers shot during a gunfight with Martin are all expected to survive. I also want to point out that you know, we're thinking about the victims of these families, uh, the families of the victims. Uh, that is also foremost in, in our thoughts. Um, and as you know, we're trying to take care of each other. Police shot and killed Martin after his rampage, meaning some answers about what caused him to do this might never be known. Chris Pallone, NBC News. Coming up back here at home, an important vaccination deadline for students is quickly approaching.
Vaccines are safe and effective. They're one of the best ways to protect your children and keep schools safe. Where parents can go to get their kids up to date on vaccinations for this school year. And slow down. Why deputies are warning drivers, take it easy on the winter roads. And Nina, we're not done with the showers just yet. The good is though, heading into tomorrow, it's gonna be a cool start, but we'll be mainly dry for Sunday and going in the early part of next week. I'll have a look at your detailed forecast when we come back.